All right, well, thank you all so much for coming to my talk. I am Molly Schwartzberg. I am a curator at the Albert and Shirley Small Special Collections Library at the University of Virginia, where we are lucky enough to house Jan Karen's papers. And today, I want to talk with you a little bit about those papers, and then, as was promised, share with you a really exciting announcement, uh, what Jan called a gift to all of you from the collections. Um, so um, I guess I'll start off by making that announcement and then go back from there and tell you a little bit about the papers and how they came to UVA and, um, and so on. So first of all, um, the announcement is that when Jan informed us that, informed me, I should say, that the Mitford Museum was happening, we decided to get moving on a project that we had been wanting to do for many years. When Jan's archive came to us in 2014, it was 66 linear feet of material. It's a lot of stuff. And when researchers come to do research in our archive, they expect to slog through 66 linear feet of material. But we knew that there's this massive world of the Mitford community out there who are not necessarily primarily going to be functioning as researchers in a 66 linear foot archive. And so we wanted to create an online exhibition to share some of the really most remarkable artifacts in that archive and introduce it to the world. And so we have done just that and launching basically today, basically as soon as I give you the URL, is an online exhibition called Inventing Mitford, the Papers of Jan Caron. And as you can see, we are going, oh yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We happily announced this launch. And as you can see, we have gone super low tech, which I'm actually really happy about. I never get to give a paper without a screen behind me. But that means that I just need to read you the name of the URL so you can find it. And Jan has also promised she will promote it excessively on her Facebook page. But if you want to take out a piece of paper and a pen, you can write this down, www.library.virginia.edu slash Mitford. The other thing you can do is just go to the UVA library homepage, finding it through Google, and just add Mitford to the end, okay? And that's where you find this wonderful little online exhibition we've created and which I'm gonna talk with you about today. Um, so how did we end up with Jan's papers at UVA? Well, in 2014, I had been at UVA for two years and I was hired to take care of our 20th century collections. And so, as part of that, I needed to make sure I knew what was going on in the literary world around Charlottesville, and I heard that the novelist Jan Karen lived nearby. So when my boss, the dean of libraries, told me she was going down to visit Jan, I asked if I could tag along on the visit. Now, she was going to visit Jan at her beautiful home in Esmont, because Jan had very kindly donated to us the original farm books from this historic home. At the University of Virginia, we house a lot of really important papers related to Central Virginia history, including anything we can get our hands on relating to Jefferson era properties. And this home has strong connections to Monticello and other Jefferson connected homes in the area. And we get a lot of researchers in working on these kinds of properties. And Jan had a lot more material from Esmont that she wanted to donate. Um, because she was getting ready to sell the home and move on to the next stage of her life. So I get in the car and I go down with the dean and the dean drove really, really fast on the most dangerous road in Charlottesville. And I remember this at the time thinking, I really hope I don't die because Esmont is down this beautiful winding road and the dean is telling me, you know, this is the deadliest road in Virginia as she's driving me to Jan's house. And we get there and thank goodness we made it in one piece because we get there and it's one of the most beautiful homes I've ever seen on the outside. And then Jan opens the door and welcomes us in, and it's just as beautiful on the inside. She has, of course, done an exquisite historical restoration and then added her own style everywhere. She immediately offered us espresso, and I have learned that this is something I can expect every single time I visit Jan. 
which is why I'm very glad that I've had to go to her house many times over the years to pick up the latest installment of her papers because she always takes me into the kitchen and makes me an espresso. So I knew she was going to be one of my favorite donors to work with when that happened. And we sit down and, and start talking with her. And so finally I think, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask her. And I just asked her, I said, can we have your papers, your literary papers? And she didn't take a very long time before she said yes. She just gave us all of her papers. It was a really remarkable moment. So when she moved out of her house in Esmont, the papers came to UVA and we cataloged them and organized them and made them available to researchers. And it is truly one of the most remarkable literary archives I've ever seen. It looks a lot like Jan uh, and it looks a lot like her house, meticulously organized extremely put together, very well arranged, and it is very thoughtfully put together. Everything easy to find with Jan's beautiful handwriting on every folder. And all aspects of Jan are in that collection. There is the creative, the writerly side, and there is the practical side. Um, and there is the personal side, all there in one place. And in my experience of the archive, you can never really extricate those from themselves. Um, and it's a little embarrassing to say all this in front of Jan, because Jan's right here. But I'm just going to say it anyway, Jan. You're going to get my opinion of you um, and your archive. But, but, that, but Jan is one of the most self-sufficient people I've ever met. And I'm sure she wouldn't think this. She probably is going to be very generous and say that there are all sorts of people helping her. But she has really pulled herself through this incredible writing career. And you can see that in her archive, just the incredible amount of hard work it has taken. But I'll also add that there's one more thing in this archive that is really remarkable, which is the amount of humanity in the archive. And by that, I mean that quite literally, the amount of mail there is from her readers in the archive. Many readers keep fan mail, but they only keep some. And this isn't fan mail. This is something else. The readers of Mitford are not fans. As Jan said, you are all each other's people. And in some ways, and I am not a religious person, so if I say something inappropriate, I apologize. But in some ways, I feel as though you are also all part of a congregation. Um, that you are the congregation receiving what Jan has written, because that is how I, as an outsider, perceive the, the relationship. And so it is remarkable how much mail from her readers Jan has kept. And seeing that really gave me some insight into how profoundly important her readers are to her, and how profoundly true what she said this morning is, that the relationship between the writer and the reader is a partnership, and they go together like this. And you feel that in the papers. Um, so just as you get to dip into those desk drawers, I don't know if you've had a chance to go into the museum yet, but you get to open those drawers and peek in, I would like to give you that experience with the archive. And that's what the online exhibition does. But then I'm going to go through the online exhibition and pick out just a few items to share with you today to tantalize you and tempt you to go look further. One of the great misconceptions of literary archives is that the center of a literary archives is the writer's manuscripts. Now, I don't mean that the manuscripts don't matter. When I first got my job at UVA, we have remarkable American literature collections. For instance, we have the papers of William Faulkner. And there are many people who come simply to look at the papers of William Faulkner. And when I first started, what I wanted to do was look at the manuscript of the Grapes of Wrath, which we have at UVA. And when I first got to sit with the manuscript of Grapes of Wrath in front of me, it was a profound experience as someone for whom that book was quite transformative. So I don't mean to say that that moment, that moment of aura where you're near the writer and near the moment when their work was created is very important. What I mean to say is that where the research value in a literary archive most often resides 
is in the correspondence files, in the letters written between the writer and any number of other people that profoundly teach you about how that writer came to be and how those works came to be. So what I'd like to do today is share with you some excerpts from some of the letters that we used in this online exhibition, which by the way is called A Journey into the Archive, um, the Jan Karen Papers. Um, so, um, the correspondence files, five letters I'd like to just excerpt for you today to give you a taste of just the number of ways in which you can go into this archive to learn more about Jan as a writer, about Mitford as a concept, and about the Mitford phenomenon, both in the publishing world and in the readerly world. The exhibition is broken into five sections, each of which represents a persona that um, we see Jan sort of inhabiting um, through the archive. The persona of the writer, the persona of the reader, the persona of the artist, the persona of the world builder, that's my favorite, and the persona of the marketer. Any new writer has to market themselves and the amount of work that Jan needed to do to bring this exceptional phenomenon up to where it is today is just amazing. And the archive shows us that whole story in a way that really nothing else can. Um, so I'd like to just kind of tell a bit of the story of how all of that happened through some of these artifacts. So one of my favorite items in the archive is when Jan decided she was ready, finally, after wanting, she's, she'd been a writer for decades, but she wanted to be an author. And it was time. She was ready to see if she could get Mitford into the world in the form of a novel. So she cold calls, basically, in the form of a letter, an agent named Jean Drusen. And we have Jan's file copy of the letter that she wrote to Jean Drusen. And I love how she opens it, because of course she's extremely talented um, rhetorically. At least two years ago, I came into possession of your very handsome business card. I admired the paper stock, the color, and the ever so slightly embossed typeface. It has been push-pinned to my studio wall ever since. I mean, how, how else would you just perfectly, you know, it's just beautiful. And then she goes on to explain, here's who I am. I'm pretty good at what I do. I'm kind of a big deal. I just got this amazing award for my marketing work, which has allowed me to quit my job. And she says, I tell you all of that history, hoping it will inspire you to read further and to learn that I'm now writing fiction. So she takes all that time before she says, I'm writing fiction. This novel in progress is called Father Tim, The Mitford Years, and is the story of a bachelor rector serving a parish of 200 souls in a mountain village. So right there, you might learn something new. We knew that the stories, when they were published in The Blowing Rocket, were called Father Tim, The Mitford Years. But I didn't know that her initial title for the first novel was not At Home in Mitford, it was Father Tim the Mitford years. So right there is something interesting, and that shift is one I'd like to know more about. She goes on to say, the ordinary, everyday people of Mitford lead ordinary lives, but I like to think there's an enchantment about their simple lives and a tender humor. Father Tim's secretary, Emma Garrett, has just dyed her gray hair quite red and is marrying the postman, 13 years her junior. Barnabas, the black maverick dog who took up with Father Tim, loves 18th century poets and can be disciplined only by the firm recitation of scripture. <laughs> and then she goes on to describe the other characters and then finishes up like this. The editor of our weekly paper, The Blowing Rocket, is running the Mitford years serially and so far so good. People really like it and quite a few have asked when it will be out in book form. Miss Drusen, so Jan, I don't know exactly what I have here. All I know is that it's popular, it's wholesome, and I believe charming and fresh. I take the liberty of enclosing three episodes. Do you think it might be something we could market to publishers? So what a brave thing to do. Writers need to really put themselves out there. And 
Jean Drusen writes back, takes Jan on as a client, and we are off to the races. So you have there that foundational moment when Mitford first begins to happen. Now it doesn't go very well. Jan has a really hard time finding a publisher. One of the things that I love about literary archives is rejection letters. There are a lot of rejection letters in a lot of literary archives, and maybe Jan can explain this to us later, I don't know, but for some reason, writers feel inspired by rejection letters. I'm seeing one here raising their hand. What year was the letter written? I am so sorry, thank you. That was the letter to, the Jean Drusen letter was 1991. Thank you. Um, and I've seen a lot of rejection letters in my time. And you can't really quite imagine that anyone would reject the Mitford novels. Well, anyone would reject the Mitford novels. There was nothing like the Mitford novels. So I want to read you part of a rejection letter that is magnificent, I think, because it captures both how remarkable the reader feels the book is but also why it is he thinks he can't publish it. It's so interesting. And we're very lucky that these books did find a publisher and eventually found the right publisher. But here is what Samuel Vaughan, a very, very prominent, prestigious editor at Random House wrote to Jean Drusen after she sent him the Mitford project in 1992. You are very good to give me a chance at this novel and very good to be so patient. Sorry I have taken as much time with it as I have, but I wanted it to have every consideration here. My reading of it and others who read it leads sadly to the conclusion that it is not for us. That is, of course, not a conclusion that it is not for everybody. Other publishers may feel differently, and I certainly hope that they do. This is a good book good in the sense of what I know were Jan's intentions. As promised, this is a novel about everyday people and everyday life in a kind of American village. True to her promise, Jan has kept her word. We see lots of life in all its details, minor incidents and turns through the eyes of a genuinely kindly man, Father Tim. As other editors have said in their readings, and I think he means other editors at Random House who've looked at the manuscript, he is a likable man, and the tone of the novel is relaxed and leisurely. But, but perhaps because the novel intentionally avoids eventfulness, consequence, major matters in the sense of major events, and other, as they say, plot-driven conventions, the traditional rules of commercial fiction don't really apply, nor, in some cases, work. Maybe there is an inherent contradiction in a long book that prides itself on being small and quiet. Now, you can't see what I can see on my screen because I'm looking at a photograph of this, and you can see this in the online exhibition. But Jan has highlighted many of these lines. And then next to this line, she's put a question mark in the margin. And I'm going to read this sentence again. Maybe there is an inherent contradiction in a long book that prides itself on being small and quiet. And we all know that that is exactly why Mitford is so great, is because it's a sustained reading experience that is small and quiet. It doesn't mean it's inconsequential, but it's small and it's quiet and it's meditative. So he goes on to say, but there may well be others who share Jan's intentions and vision, and we know that there are some readers who share it out there somewhere. <laughs> Says the lovely man who has no idea that this is a novelist whose books are gonna debut at number one on the New York Times bestseller list on a regular basis. I feared the book would not fare well on the Random House list at this particular moment and so cannot take it on. But as I say, I do regret that fact and I do have considerable admiration for what has been achieved here. What a great rejection letter. I mean, this is a rejection letter that anybody has got to want to keep, right? But it really speaks to the fact that Chan's work didn't fit any of those standard 
categories. And as he says, the traditional rules of commercial fiction don't really apply. And that's something that ends up, of course, being the challenge that Mitford has to rise to and manages to transcend. So fortunately, she finds Lion, a small Christian publishing house. They publish the first book, and it has great success, despite the fact that they really lack the capacity to, um, to, to uh, publicize the book in the way it deserves. In fact, Jan does that work herself. She's on the ground working with bookstores, and you can see this in the archive. You can see the work that she does as a first-time novelist hand-selling this book, building relationships. And this is 1994. This is when little bookstores, which are at the heart of the Christian publishing industry, are being pushed out by the big chains. And of course, it's only a few years before those big chains themselves are almost destroyed by Amazon. So something very interesting about Mitford is that it happens at a time of crisis in the publishing industry, and somehow, manages to actually thrive in all of those changing environments. So one of my favorite items is this letter from the Evergreen Scripture Bookstore in Canada. This is a fax that someone there sent to Jan in 1995, letting her know how excited everyone is in the bookstore about the next book coming from Lion, and they're very eager to hear more about it. And then after she's finished with her, the business part of the letter, she includes a paragraph on a personal note, which is very, very common in these letters. On a personal note, I sent a copy of the book to my father for Christmas. My father is not a Christian, but I thought that he would enjoy the book. I cannot tell you the emotions that I felt when he told me that he had enjoyed it so much that he had passed it along to my grandmother. As it turns out, she was raised Anglican and stopped going to church after she was married. She also enjoyed the book very much. Thank you, Jan. There are few books that we sell here that I feel comfortable about sharing with my family. I was so glad to find a book to give dad for Christmas that both he and I would like. It being our book of the year intrigued me as well. Again, thank you. This paragraph encapsulates what happens with Mitford, is that it becomes a crossover book. It is a book that transcends the different types of audiences that are expected to, to be drawn to a book, right? There's the Christian audience, the Christian publishing audience, and there's the general trade publishing audience. And what this bookseller is showing is that these, the stories in Mitford, and the way Mitford is told, transcends those boundaries. So it's a wonderful example of what we see elsewhere in the archive and through all of the record of Mitford is just how widely this message goes regardless of faith, with faith at the core, but regardless of faith. Really, really remarkable. And finally, um, another uh, letter in about the books that I wanted to share is a letter from 2006 um, from a reader, and this is the kind of letter we find throughout the collection, just lots of these letters that really show that if you're going to think about Jan Karen the writer and Mitford the phenomenon, you can't just be thinking about novels. You can't just be thinking about fiction writers. This is not a set of novels. This is something more than that. So this writer says, I have a friend whose husband just died of Alzheimer's, and she has been as blessed as we were to be able to go to Mitford after we got her started. So first of all, she doesn't say, and she has been as blessed to read your books. No, she says she has been as blessed to be able to go to Mitford after we got her started, and constantly reminds me of what a gift it was at that very draining time. God has used you as that gift in so many lives. And this reader is from Wyoming. We will look for you in heaven. Do you think we will be able to wave some Indian paintbrush, Wyoming state flower, so that you will know us? Um, I just love that. It sounds like an Emily Dickinson poem right there. Um, but I think that this is a another thing that's so important about these books, that we have over here that phenomenon I just mentioned of this ability of the books to transcend audiences. But we also have shown here that the books really transcend genre. 
These are not just novels. They are books of consolation, books of prayer. Um, they, they function in a way that most novels do not in people's lives. And that's really interesting and really important and to really understanding this phenomenon. Um, so finally, I'd like to take the last part of my talk to talk about one last letter. But before that, I'd like to ask all of you, tell me all how you feel about the short story by Jan, The Day Aunt Maud Left. None of you have ever heard of this story, have you? Yeah. So one of the things that I was really excited to find in the archive is how much material there is on Jan's young life as a creative person, long before she was able to sit down and write the Mitford stories. And in the early 1960s, when Jan was living in Charlotte, she ran a little magazine, a little, little interdisciplinary arts magazine called Response. And in that magazine, which is beautifully designed, exquisite, very early 1960s black and white photography, all these beautiful sort of grayish brown, different kinds of paper stock, and wonderful art by a range of artists. Um, she published this little magazine, and she included one of her own stories in one of the issues of this magazine. And we put this in the online exhibition and it's called The Day Aunt Maud Left. And it's a story about an aunt who's living with the family of the narrator and does not get along with the father and finally leaves after a number of explosive fights with the father. And when we put this exhibition together, I told Jan years ago, I don't know if you even remember this, Jan, I remember saying to Jan, now it's really important when we do this exhibition that this is the library's exhibition, and we'll let you take a look at it, but we're gonna to put together the exhibition that we feel represents the archive. And she said, I understand that entirely. And so when I finished the exhibition, I went to Jan and I said, you know, we'd love you to take a look and make sure that we didn't miss anything or get anything wrong and let us know if you have any problems with anything. And we had great conversations and she corrected my typos and she even improved my writing a couple times. It's really embarrassing to have Jan read your writing. Um, <laughs> She's a really good copy editor. Um, and then she didn't say anything, but I said, now Jan, I wanna let you know that I have included your story the day Aunt Maud left. And there's a silence on the other end of the phone. And this was just a few weeks ago. And she said, I really hope that you don't do that. And it was because there's lots of cursing. Shock of shocks. This is not something you will ever find in Jan's writing. And we know how important this is to Jan. And I, and I thought, oh no, what am I going to do? I said, Jan, please, can we please include it? And we had a wonderful conversation where I explained to her why I wanted to include it, because part of the story we're telling in this exhibition is about Jan's transformation, the transformation she mentioned this morning in her talk, that moment of crisis when her life changed and when she found God. Um, and so, she agreed with me and said we could include the story, um, but only if I promised to explain to you guys why we did, because she didn't want you to be upset about the language. Um, and I think it's so important and so wonderful because following that item in the exhibition, I think the next thing you see in the section on the writer is the most important artifact in the exhibition, and I think probably the most important artifact in the entire archive. In 1981, Jan read an article um, by a woman in I don't know where, we haven't been able to figure out where this was published, but someone named Joe wrote an article called Finding the, Finding, hang on a second, Finding the, I can't believe I just forgot the word, Finding the feather stitch in a crazy quilt world, okay? And Jan read this article and found it profoundly moving and wrote a letter to the author. And she kept a carbon of that because as Jan told me, she just loves to file, um, which I love. I mean, who doesn't, what librarian curator doesn't love a writer who loves to file? So she kept a file copy of this letter and in this letter, she describes the Jan who was 
the writer who wrote The Day Aunt Maud Left and her transformation into the person she was to become. And I want to read you part of this letter. It's four pages typed, single spaced. It is remarkable. And I think, to me, this reads as a spiritual autobiography in the form of a letter. So I just want to read you part of it, and then that'll be the conclusion of, of my talk. I am a writer who was raised about 15 miles from Hickory in a small mill town called Hudson. My memories of Hickman's drugstore and of all drugstores in the 40s was chicken salad sandwiches mash, mashed flat in the big grill, cherry Cokes, five cent ice cream cones, and the cold welcome feel of the marble sound soda counter. I never went to teas, but I did visit Aunt Hesse in Lenore, who had fine china, silver, beveled glass in the doors, and a lot of gracious dignity. Like you, I married, divorced, and moved far from home. She puts home in quotes. Unlike you, I married and divorced yet again. My life was breaking into fragments, coming apart in oddly shaped pieces. I hated and rejected my past, which critically influenced my connection with the present. So I lived a lot in the future. Something in me for years longed for the values, or some of them, that my old native culture had offered Church, hats on Sunday, chicken dinners, I had become a rather strict vegetarian, rides on Sunday afternoons, simple things. In 1970, after a very difficult few years in California, during which my community of Berkeley was often in a state of civil warfare, I returned home. During all this time, I too was searching for the feather stitch, something I admired in reality right up there with the French knot. I became curious about religion, but the fashion of the time was Eastern, so I looked to the East. Now, do any of you know any of this about Jan? Isn't this amazing? She's telling this biography here that is just remarkable. I remembered my times in Sunday school and Bible class, I mean Bible school, and the way the grape juice tasted and the beautiful pictures of Jesus with the lamb. So she's looking back to those early childhood days. But there were also some very unpleasant associations with that experience. Because I was disappointed as a child in Christians, I also rejected Christ. Besides, wasn't all that out of date, simplistic, and fundamentally death-centered? Still no lovely feather stitch but lots of disappointment, plain craziness, and uncertainty. I took an old farmhouse after a six-week tour of New England in my appropriate VW bus. I'd like to pause there. By the way, I am from Berkeley, California. So the VW bus in 1970, that was like my childhood. Um, so I love this image of Jan, you know, driving through New England in her VW bus, and then finally, finally, um, taking this old farmhouse. It was run down, neglected in all regards, but absolutely the most exciting thing I'd seen. This was the feather stitch. I was convinced of it. It was painted inside and out. The curtains went up at the windows. I was, on, I was living on subsistence wages at the time, occasionally freelancing with area agencies. The bulbs and azaleas went into the red clay, and there I was, deep in the country, alone, for a two-year healing process that was at once one of the most trying and nourishing circumstances of my life. I began to pray on my terms, you understand, not with any real supplication or surrender, but at least a kind of dialogue developed between my creator and me, a kind of ribbon of understanding. God showed me how to really look at everything and showed me the extraordinary differences between two of the very same things. It was, in a way, an Annie Dillard experience, and I felt drawn toward God in a very special read, in a very special way. So I don't know if any of you have read Pilgrim at Tinker Creek. Jan, I'm assuming that was the book you were referring to. I left the farm in 1974, still praying occasionally, but giving God the crusts. I went to church occasionally, but as a distant 
I don't want to get involved, observer. During these church visits, I seldom heard anything more than cursory scripture. After all, it is fashionable now for the churches to be liberal. This is a very different moment from where we are now, right? So she's sort of getting us back to 1974. In May of 1980, I finally came to the end of myself, Joe. Totally. It wasn't a breakdown. It wasn't something that needed clinical attention. It wasn't even a lot of breast beating. I just came to the end of myself. I still hadn't found anything that tied it all together, that made it whole, of a piece that offered any hope for the future that was palpable and real. And it is at this moment that then she goes on and gives a detailed description of her transformative religious experience that she had at this moment, without which we would never have gotten to Mitford and where we are today. And can cruelly leave that for you all to read because it's too long for me to go into here. And really, frankly, I don't quite feel I'm the person to read that to you because it is just too important. And I want you to all go online and read that letter yourselves in order to see Jan's transformation. I'm gonna stop there and hope that this gives you some introduction to Jan's archive and to some of the ways that these artifacts that surround the Mitford phenomenon can get us to understand it and can supplement and complement it in really profound and interesting ways. I encourage all of you to come to UVA. You are all welcome to come do research in the archive. You can just bring your driver's license and we will welcome you in, help you pick a box. You can pull a whole box of reader mail and read what, write, what others have felt. You can look at the manuscripts of the novels. You can look at, at all of it and we encourage you to come. But most of all, we encourage you to go look at the online exhibition to get just that taste that'll give you a sense of the generosity that Jan has um, given this archive to all of us by making it available at the UVA library. And I am glad to take questions. Thank you very much. We've got about eight minutes for questions and I'm gonna to have to ask you to project through those masks. So yes. Can you repeat the website that we can find? Yes. So it's www.library.virginia.edu slash Mitford. Say it again. <laughs> www.library.virginia.edu slash Mitford. And it will be all over Jan's Facebook, I hope, if she liked my talk. Other questions? Yes? Right now, no appointments are required. We did have appointments for about the last year. But you'll want to look at the website for the UVA Special Collections Library. And you can always email me. That's schwartzberg at virginia.edu. And I'm happy to make sure that everything's available for you. Schwartzberg at virginia.edu. I saw a hand over here. I feel like I saw a hand over here. No. Okay. Yes. So with the um, letters and what you may have received with the rejection, are there any follow-up like Random House or others that maybe came back and said, wow. That's a great question. You know, I don't remember whether there's anything like that. There are more, there's more than one letter from Samuel Vaughn. That, that's not a, a one item correspondence. I don't know if Jan might want to add something here. I'll just add that Samuel Vaughn was one of the old world editors. He was a gentleman, he was beloved, he edited <coughs> some of the most famous American writers of this time. He was a gentleman to me. He saw me in his office, a young woman, a little lot working all on and I came in with my humble little expectations and he treated me like a queen. Uh, so what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> so I hope everyone heard that, that Jan was saying that she had just a wonderful experience meeting with Samuel Vaughn when she was first trying to get the book yes, published. And I spoke with him a couple of times so afterward and he did, he said, well, I did regret it. 
really like it, but I knew that I could not get it through our house, the publishing house. But I did hear from Al Bondley. Al Bondley became a very renowned publishing house in North Carolina. They went up, they did their own crossover. They crossed over into a very large blockbuster that people after seven years they've now sold, I think, to the world. In any case, the editor told me, he said, when I turned out the name was he said, <laughs> so I, I used to work at the University of Texas uh, at a, a major uh, special collections library that held the archives of Alfred Knopf publishers. And the rejection files uh, are the best part of the archive because it's like, it's just like pure schadenfreude, you know, you just go through these files and you're just like, how could they have rejected, you know, Sylvia Plath or, you know, I mean, every publisher does this. And part of it is that there's a magic to a book's success that no one can predict. And Mitford had a very particular magic um, in its success. I mean, part of it is just that hard plotting work of getting the book sold. But no one knows what's going to be the next Mitford, do they, Jan? Except Jan, she knew. Yes, so a few years ago, we got to do a huge exhibition on our William Faulkner collection, which is just a remarkable archive, just stunning, and very heavily used by researchers. And actually, when I put together Jan's online exhibition and broke it up into personae, I realized after I had done it that that was the same way that I'd structured the Faulkner show, Jan. So it was structured around all the different personalities of, of William Faulkner. And one of them was the teacher. And he was in residence at UVA late in his life. He was writer in residence at the University of Virginia, and that's how his papers ended up at UVA. And he'd always had sort of the mystique of UVA always attracted him. It seemed like the sort of pinnacle of the, of the old, the old high-bred South. <laughs> this was kind of the Faulkner dream. And, um, and so he was delighted to have his papers end up at UVA um, after, um, after his death. Um, he, he had uh, agreed to, to leave them there. And um, one of the things, he passed away unexpectedly. He was away from UVA in Mississippi on a hunting trip. Um, and he had left, you know, everything as he did when he went away to visit home in Mississippi. He'd left everything as it was in Charlottesville. And he'd left his riding jacket on the back of his desk chair. And so we put it in the exhibition. And there are wonderful pictures of him with his jacket on. And it was this old, just terribly dinged up old riding jacket. And he loved to wear his clothes to death. And he always had a pipe in his pocket. And so there are all these pipes, too. We have several. We also have his pipe cleaners. I love that we have like a box of William Faulkner's pipe cleaners, you know, and they're like, here's William Faulkner's pipe cleaners. <laughs> um, the aura of the writer, it's just wonderful. I mean, it's sort of like some of the things in the, in the Mitford Museum, right? It's just, these are these artifacts of the writer, these things that were central to their lives. And that riding jacket, so important to Faulkner. In fact, the university president when I first started at UVA, or right, he retired just as I started at UVA, John Castine had been a student at UVA when Faulkner was in residence. And Faulkner had his, he had been one of Faulkner's student assistants, student helpers. And Faulkner apparently liked to have um, a student um, bring his horse to campus, and then Faulkner would get on the horse and ride home so that he could, you know, be the gentleman uh, horseback rider um, through campus. And it's just very funny. He was quite a performer. And so everything that he did was performance. We also had his, his World War I uniform. Faulkner never actually served in World War I. He went to training camp in England. He had some ailment that made him, him, him unable to serve in the U.S. And so he, he went to Canada and um, joined the RAF, the Canadian RAF, and had his own uniform made and everything. And then the war ended before he could go. But he would wear the uniform around Oxford, Mississippi, and he would limp, and he would tell people about the glass plate, or the, sorry, the metal plate in his head. 
and it was all a huge lie. And it was just wonderful because that was just Faulkner. And so that riding jacket was one of those personae. But Jan, I feel like you, you would never lie about a metal plate in your head. She certainly wouldn't smoke pie. Very unladylike. <laughs> oh, it's just wonderful. So literary archives are, are a treasure, um, and they really, um, there's a generosity in giving up your papers and letting go and letting people write that short story. Yes, it is. And I'd also like to say how much I've gained from working with Jan. We had this conversation about this, uh, about this item. And after the end of it, when Jan had said, yes, go ahead and, and, and display it, and then she said, every saint has a past, every sinner has a future. Amen. And someone in the last group fortunately looked it up for us, Oscar Wilde. <laughs> And it's a wonderful thing in that Jan could come up with a bit of wisdom from that conversation, and there's always something like that. So Jan, thank you so much for, for everything that you've given to your readers and to me as someone who has the pleasure of working with your archive. Thank you so much. I think we're out of time, so thank you all.